Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. Are you using the most of your brain's energy? If you're feeling burned out, scatterbrained, or befuddled, this is definitely the show for you. Here with us today is Dr. Andrew Hill, one of the leading neurofeedback practitioners in the country. Dr. Hill holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA's Department of Psychology, where he continues his research on attention and cognition. But before we get there, here's a note that came in from Ted. He says, Abel, I just wanted to thank you for the positive impact that you've had in my overall perspective on holistic health. I am 51 years old, and thanks to your guidance and videos, I adopted a holistic lifestyle over two years ago. I was a type 2 diabetic on insulin and metformin. I weighed 270 pounds and my A1C was 8.5. After numerous side effects and realizing I was just treating symptoms, I went all in on intermittent fasting and a holistic lifestyle. I now weigh 205 and I take zero medication. I do need to watch my carb intake, but I feel amazing. My A1C was just measured today at 5.7. I am now gearing up for phase two, and I'm applying detoxification practices. I will also be starting a three to five day fast. I took a lot of notes on my holistic approach to type two diabetes. It makes me so upset to see the money being made in that industry, and obviously the crap in the grocery stores is a gold mine. Here's what I learned. Diabetes is a metabolic disorder caused by high insulin levels. Treat the high insulin levels, smiley face sticking his tongue out. Our kids need a better nutritional future. My 15-year-old daughter loves your channel and your most sound recommendations. I am so relieved that you and your family are safe after the carbon monoxide scare. Happy New Year, Ted, a Wild Diet tribe member. Ted, thank you so much for writing in and sharing this with us. It makes me laugh. I've had a couple of notes like this where people are saying that their teenage kids uh, daughters and sons are listening to this show, and uh, I love that. I, you know, ever since we started this coming up on a decade ago, good lord, uh, we wanted to make this show family friendly so that those of you out there with little ones can listen to this in the car or listen to it when you're cleaning up the house or just have it be out there without it being overtly mature. But I think it's really important to keep this show available and accessible to all of you. And I love that you listen with your families. Also, Ted, I mean, you're down 65 pounds and you're off your meds. That is the goal. You're, you're doing it. And also losing 65 pounds is about the weight of our eight-year-old Labrador retriever. So well done, Ted. And thank you, Ted, also for checking in and just uh, mentioning the carbon monoxide scare. It was very, very rough. And our, our friends and community and people like you help get us through the roughest of times. And we want to be here for you, listeners and, and members of our community, when you're going through hard times. So don't be shy on that, on that note. Drop me a line at abel at fatburningman.com. Please visit fatburningman.com with an archive of over 300 of these shows with full transcripts, so you don't even have to listen the whole way through. You can get it all, and it's free of outside advertising. That's all at fatburningman.com. Even better, if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get a whole bunch of freebies, including our recipes. I give away, well, we've given away tens of thousands of free eBooks in the past few uh, months alone. And so make sure that you're signed up for the newsletter over at fatburningman.com. It's much more reliable than social media platforms, which are really ratcheting up the censorship and, and making sure that we can't talk about certain things. So if you want to get the whole deal, then go to fatburningman.com. You can always find us there. And also, if you're looking for a community of like minded health nuts who are looking to improve their lives and get real results, then join us in the Fat Burning Tribe. Right now when you join, you'll get instant access to our monthly wild meal plans, our recipe library, quick start video library downloads, and much, much more to help you start shedding fat while enjoying delicious 
home-cooked meals. Plus, the longer you're a member, the more you unlock in the members area. It's time to blast through that plateau, lose stubborn fat, and finally shatter your personal training records. We can help you get there. Right now, when you join the tribe, you get the first week for free for a limited time. You can also cancel any time, and you keep all your downloads as a free gift for trying it out. So if you're interested in joining us, make sure you go to fatburningtribe.com to get the deal. One more time, that's fatburningtribe.com. I look forward to seeing you in the members area. And also, if you're looking for a deal on our favorite supplements in the entire world, you can also support us by shopping at Wild Superfoods. Go to wildsuperfoods.com. When you sign up for the subscribe and save, then you actually get the Fat Burning Tribe coaching community, membership, meal plans, all of that on the house as part of your Wild Superfoods subscription as our thanks for helping to support this show. Every dollar you spend at fatburningman.com, fatburningtribe.com, wild30.com, and wildsuperfoods.com directly supports us, keeps the lights on, and makes sure that we can keep this show coming to you. So we always appreciate your support. Please visit wildsuperfoods.com, sign up for the subscribe and save, and we'll really appreciate you joining us in our community. All right, on to the show with Dr. Andrew Hill. We're chatting about advancements in brain tech, what to do about our befuddled brains, how to keep a healthy brain as you age, why social media is the opposite of neural feedback, and tons more. Let's go hang out with the doc. All right, folks, here with us today, Dr. Andrew Hill is one of the leading neurofeedback practitioners in the country. He holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA's Department of Psychology and continues to do research on attention and cognition. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Abel. I really appreciate it. So I, I love this. People who are listening on audio probably aren't aware, but you're surrounded right now by guitars yeah, and instruments. I am and I yeah. am as well. Oh my God, you're really surrounded. This is great. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, is, this is actually my, my, my yoga room. I come in here every morning and do yoga for 45 minutes or so, and there's nothing in the room but um, yoga mat and guitars. It's kind of a nice, uh, very cool, you know, combination. So. And then when you have all those guitars hanging up like that, it affects the acoustics in a really pleasant way too. It's subtle, but. Yeah, 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 exactly. So. So we'll we'll talk about music and how that's kind of exercise for the brain in a minute. But but as I was going through uh, some of your work and and thinking about neurofeedback in particular, I, the more it made me think of, especially in today's world, like social media and all the conditioning uh, that we're used to, especially in the way that we interact with the machines, is basically the opposite of neurofeedback. Right? It's frazzling us more and more, and uh, we we almost need something to offset that, even if it is high tech itself. Yeah, I mean, certainly we, we learn in lots of ways. And I mean, we can learn poorly as well as, you know, uh, ways that help us. Not all information is good. Um, just like, I mean, and this, this sort of extends broadly, this concept, you know, addiction is just learning broadly as well. Hmm. So, you know, so is, so is fake media, you know, like, yep. and, and, and developing a, a socialized mindset that is distorted and full of hate and violence through, you know, uh, uh, being fed nonsense. So it's, you know, it, you can learn lots of ways, um, guarding the quality of information, just like the quality of food in your body or the quality of reinforcers you engage with day to day to manage some of that learning. Um, I think is our responsibility as, uh, you know, thinking, feeling, learning creatures. So maybe you can comment on, on the fact that, uh, most of the conditioning that happens to us, we're not aware of consciously, right? So people oh, sure. be like, Oh, this isn't happening to me. Well, I mean, most information we get in, we aren't aware of, you yeah. know, it is uh, it's certainly even in verbal information, I would argue verbal is among the most human and it's among the most, um, you know, intellectual and cognitive way that we communicate is in this language bound way. And we would say that we understand if, if we understand a language, we understand the context of the communication, but you know, 90, 95% of the information that comes in in verbal communication is actually the nonverbal aspects, the prosody, the lilt, the, the tone, the, the strain in the voice, the, um, you know, we're adding video to this uh, discussion so that we can get some nuanced face expressions, mm -hmm. some micro expressions, some sense of uh, uh, the, uh, other things that aren't communicated by the, you know, the way the words on a page would be communicated. There's a reason we, we, we act and have movies, not just books, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a very, very nuanced and rich way we learn. And so that comes in, and then we can extend that to, um, 
you know, there's, there's a lot of science around the marketing uh, of aspects, and we've, we've really distilled and refined what will grab attention, you know, like uh, intermittent reinforcers, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, the one on slot machines or, or um, uh, you know, Vegas uh, coin gobble gobblers. Those things will cause us to learn especially well because the reward is unpredictable and not in a schedule and intermittent and you know, it's, it's very unreliable in terms of rewarding. Those are the most interesting things to our mm -hmm. brain. So re, uh, marketers know this and advertisers know this, and we have colors and shapes and sexiness and things that are spaced in such a way and grab uh, uh, um, the appetitive nature, the, the desire of the brain to grab things in the world by everything being extra juicy and sexy and salty and yummy and, you know, it, mm -hmm. broadly. And, and that will distort what we bind to. This is why we have a, a, a crisis of, um, you know, metabolism, certainly in the Western world, in this country, through um, many of us having the common, you know, the, the absolute perfect storm of, of nutrition, of, you know, fat, salt, and um, starch all in one giant quantity. Um, at the same time, you can kind of do any of those things in isolation, no problem. And, mm -hmm. you know, which, uh, but you can't really do fat, starch, and salt in large quantities together without dying. Yep. It's a lovely way to die, you know, and that's about it. Um, so, but, but that's the reason we have those highly accessible, high reward value foods is because they cause a change in behavior. They cause us to open our wallets and buy the can of, you know, highly processed, whatever it is, food. Um, because they're extra rewarding. We're, we're wired yeah. a little bit towards things that have super high reward value. The world wasn't a world full of only richly rewarding things dietarily, you know, over the past 100,000 years. So it's it's a little bit hard to um, to resist this kind of learning. And most learning does come, you know, and, and when, you, when you go to abstract learning, not just, you know, food and and obvious rewards, but, but informational rewards like social media and the news and things like that. Now we're getting, again, we tend to take those sources that are external to us in social media and in news and actually kind of construct an in-group, out-group kind of distinction and then take a whole bunch of information and treat it as trusted. And therefore, anything yeah. that comes in from that particular source, however we really identify ourselves, and modern world is about identification to some extent. You know, what is your, you know, the politics of identity here? You know, what is your, what do you consider yourself? And then when people talk about that self, you know, that, that category you identified with, you know, you really try to re defend it and reject mm -hmm. it and do a bunch of things around managing it. That's because you're being told lots of things about that particular um, aspect of yourself. And, and you can be shaped into lots of behavior, like buying high reward value, salty, fatty foods, like smoking in the 70s and 80s, like, you know, uh, rallying hate and, and you know, intolerance uh, instead of, you know, love uh, and acceptance is happening worldwide. This, this push towards isolationism and nationalism is happening in many, many countries and, and causing more and more strife. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's marketing. You know, it's, it's, it's nasty marketing, but it's marketing. Yeah. Um, and it's effective because and I think in a really um, – at least that particular aspect of dividing people from each other, I think it's, it's effective to get a uh, uh, far afield for a second because we're good at doing in-group, out-group stuff for evolutionary survival reasons, protecting mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's only so much – you know, this, this William Mammoth myth is only so much meat or something for the next you know, month. We better know who's our family so our tribe gets to eat and the other tribe we, we protect uh, our resources from. And we're good at doing in-group, out-group things, evolutionary. Some good research out of uh, – somebody out of uh, UCSD, who I forget, who's done some really lovely research on the – how this informs sort of an ethnic bias and a bunch of other co politics and policy. Mm -hmm. And we almost institutionalize sort of subtle evolutionary pressures that aren't – we don't need to. I mean, I mean race and ethnicity is an artifact. It's, a, it's, a, it's an artificial construct. Mm -hmm. It fails – about three millimeters below what you can see. You know, race is, mm -hmm. is, is, is pure. I mean, ethnicity is not, not a construct, but that's as much about culture as it is about genetics. Um, but, the, but race, racial genetics, is not a scientifically valid construct in the slightest. I say this to my, my students, and, and, and many of them feel very uncomfortable with this idea that I'm dismissing race as a valid construct. Sure. But I'm not, dis I'm not dismissing the cultural aspects of race or um, heritage or, cult or, or you know, how you, how you were, 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 were built and some of that is genetics, but something like a third of your of your experience as a human, including development, including aging, including disease, including how you think, about a third of it's your genes. Um, huge amount of uh, variability within the same rough genetic starting place for people mm -hmm. in terms of where they end up. 
even with exact genetics and you know, twin studies and things, you can get some pretty different effects in the environment. Not, not completely. It's about a third of your experience in your brain aging and your brain development and your sort of personality set points you start off with that can shift a little bit. Personality is a pretty stable resource across life. Um, but like, you know, speed of processing, working memory, some of those things that are the, the coarse resources, um, brain laterality, left and right, you know, sort of development, language acquisition, math and language sort of abilities, that those things are a little bit built in, but not completely. But broadly, everything else is learned, including who you hate, who you love, uh, how much fat you have on your body um, at any one moment in time, um, which drugs you find extra interesting and, and, and disrupt your life and which, you know, relationships you find especially disturbing. That's all learned. You know, you have to, and, and you can relearn that. That that's that's the nice thing. And the uh, Peak Brain, my, my company's official uh, or unofficial motto is now: shift happens, get yours. Nice. So it's like, come on, you know, your brain's changing and your body's changing and everything's changing all around you. That's a, I mean, I spent a lot of my life fighting change and being like, oh my god, there's so much going on. And how do I manage? Mm-hmm. You know, be at three jobs at once when I was working in hospitals or you know grad school and all kinds of other career shifts. I mean, so many aspects of my life have been just flat out grinding for like 20, 30 years. And that works sometimes, but it's not the most efficient. And instead of fighting, a lot of that grind is to sort of drive my direction of change or or, or goals or skills or whatever I was trying to get against the chaos. And I I instead think that since we're already being patterned by reality, we, 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 we bounce off of reality and change ourselves to optimize gains and minimize pains. That's what the brain's doing. So that's why we learn so effectively from these carrots and sticks in media and news and things. Um, but I, I think instead of fighting against all those pressures, we have an opportunity to lean into the ones that cause the most shift, you know, the, the, the best dynamic regulation, the shifts in the right direction, things like, you know, going keto or fasting to produce better insulin sensitivity. That's about dynamic range. So your insulin system doesn't learn itself into a static place of insulin insensitivity or cortisol doesn't learn itself into a place of cortisol insensitivity to produce depression and sleep disruption, for instance. But that's learning. I mean, you you could think about the system as a dynamic system that must, you know, we're really good at adapting to almost anything. But the place we stay the healthiest and the highest uh, level of performance is the place where we're in that sweet spot. We have flexibility to continue to change within the dynamic, the dynamic nature of the stressors and the information, not the edge of variability. I mean, from, from a metabolic perspective, I'm sure this rings quite true for you, you know, um, the, the idea that things must remain dynamic to remain healthy. And that's mm-hmm. broadly true, not just in physiology, I think, but in how we think and in relationships and in everything else. So um, learning can make your or uh, information can make your learning fairly rigid and you can, you know, not, not think in as flexible or as dynamic ways as you might need to. Uh, so yes, you're, you're largely patterned by the world to get off on a slightly esoteric tangent. I dig it. Well, one of the things that happens with social media is it's just, uh, so scattering. So it, it's like, one of the things that I feel happened in the past five or 10 years with the internet, especially is that it's become more and more, lowest common denominator more and more in your face with the things that you can't help the primitive lowest part of you can't help but be like ah because fear and terror and hate these things are arousing right they're they're meant to get your reaction whereas boring good for you content yeah doesn't really stand out and and also a a huge amount of like um dangling you know information like clickbait where right this here, here's a crazy headline. You're like, Oh, wait a minute. I have to find what happens next. Or what's the three crazy things I need to know about my weight loss or my, my mortgage, whatever it is. I mean, so much spam, but there's a lot of even, even relatively, you know, good media sources that are doing clickbaity types of things, their headlines. And half the time you go there, you're like this, no, this, the headline has no relationship to this. Or it's incorrect, you know, right. It's it's completely misleading. A lot of times the headline, the clickbait will say the opposite of what the video actually says, which is even even seeing that's what I mean. It's like that used to be a few like Internet marketer scammers back in the day. And now it's like literally like main media mainstream folks. And, 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 and our threshold for for um, for vetting this information is starting to drop a little bit. I think the signal yeah. noise ratio is dropping. So more and more you see people who should actually stop and look at something before they repost it, before they use it. They just pull something out that seems to match like it's you know it's the equivalent of my students handling a paper where they read the abstracts mm-hmm. and wrote a paper on the abstracts and didn't actually yeah. read the papers 
versus um, you know some actually looking at the thing and constructing some sense of the information they're passing on. And, and we're doing that more and more. I think we're going to do that more and more because there's so much more information flooding through us all the time, you know, and we just can't keep a track of it. But you know, you have some responsibility again to manage what you think. That's the only thing you, you, you can't manage what happens to you completely. You can't manage all the suffering you experience. You can manage how you uh, frame it all and, and, and how you react to it. So, uh, I mean, that's, 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 that's the challenge, the ongoing challenge. And, and for me, and maybe I'd be interested in your opinion about this because you have such diverse experience, but for, for music, it's exercising pretty much every part of the brain you've got. It's keeping you sharp. It's for me, it's, I, I think it's one of the reasons that I'm decent at hosting a podcast because it's all about timing. It's about re- repetitive nature of, of, different tasks it's about mostly focus like I wake up in the morning and I practice piano for an hour and then I practice guitar and do a little ear training as well and so that is the opposite of what social media is doing with all those notifications and shapes and colors and kind of like pulling you out whereas this is practicing the same scale for 15 minutes straight or whatever right Uh, so I'd be interested in 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 your um, take on what exactly that's doing so there's um, a lot of research showing that music is a whole brain phenomena, like like you described, um, and it does a lot of stuff. And uh, there's a really great book by uh, Daniel Levitin. This is your brain on music, or yeah. your brain on music. Great book. Um, and and um, uh, he sort of comes from, in some ways, like a cousin, a school of neuroscience for me. You know, he's sort of like trained by a guy who was trained by, you know, we sort of come from like you know sister families, if you will. And I, I have a very similar perspective on a lot of this stuff as he does, but I'm a little more. In- informed by the laterality, the left versus right sort of organization of brain, I think, and a lot of how I think about the brain just because I was trained by a laterality guy, a split brain scientist and things, and uh, named Dr. Aran Zidel, who's a uh, left-right hemisphere attention guy uh, at UCLA. And um, so, uh, yes, for me, the, the biggest impact, if you will, of doing music is to some extent balancing left and right hemispheres. The other extent is doing the thing that language does. Language is very, very special in the brain. And I believe that music operates in a very similar way to language. When you're a musician, when you're doing what what you are doing, to some extent what I'm doing, when we're playing with music, practicing music, we are not, it's not the same as, I mean, uh, there's this idea that if you become a musician, you can't enjoy music the same way. You start to tear it apart and, oh, that's, you hear the sour notes. I would argue that happens when you're a um, new musician or a moderate musician. With experience, you start to hear all the sour notes and the, weirdness and you yeah things great on you and you have to pick it apart intellectually as you're learning the language you hear the errors in the language so to speak and once you become a deep musician years and years and years of being musical you start to hear the things that are that are beyond the technical execution and you start to be able to hear amazing music delivered by people who are actually sloppy players yeah or you know the homeless guy in the street who's playing the the, the public piano is like you know, really not that great technically, but oh my God, is he amazing right. promoting, you know, what he's, what he's communicating. So for me, it's about language. And I think that language is a very special thing that is hard to hack in the brain. I'm all about biohacks, all about doing things to take control of the brain and the body. You know, whatever you want to have in your brain and your body, you should have. I mean, seriously, there's almost no limit to hacking the brain in terms of what, what you know, you could, if, you, if a human has had a resource or you know humans that can do things, or don't have problems, or or have certain resources available. You too can have those resources. It's not that on. It's not that hard. You know, it's kind of like looking at a gym bro who's like all jacked and yeah. walking around, going, "Oh, I'd love to have that kind of abs and pecs." Well, you can if you want to. Like, there's a path to it. It's, it's not that hard. It just takes a little bit of like execution and a little bit of planning. Um, in the case of you know getting like this, you want to do a lot of meal planning and a lot of exercise. You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, 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 and read a lot of internet and, you know, forget to work out your lower half of your body. But, um, uh, in the case of doing, you know, biohacking, there's lots of things you can do. Language is one of the hard ones because it has lots of critical periods where the brain stops developing yeah. in a lot of ways. So, you know, kids can generate language, uh, resources really, really well. You pattern, uh, Chomsky was, v- was vindicated not too long ago in that there are g- grammar learning machinery bits in the brain. The brain does actually have machinery with which to imprint grammar. To, it, it's ready to learn a structured process when we're born, actually before we're born. There's a built-in grammar learning system. That's a big, con, uh, a big uh, a controversy for many, many years. But, mm-hmm. but Noam Chomsky, you know, asserted it was true. He's a neurolinguistic guy. And yes, it seems to be true. Um, however, what language you learn isn't built in. Um, babies can uh, understand 
what their language is and what is not their language before they're born. The moment they're born, a baby can tell my language, not my language because of the statistical patterns of the hearing for the past several months through the the womb wall. It does signal signal matching on the pattern of the language, the rhythms of the language. Um, so, so that, that's the first socialization is, is, is what rhythms sound nice or, or are mine yeah. or are my environment. And then when you're born, you hear a new language. You're like, whoa, that's not my language. That's weird. And you can tell I mean, it's really obvious when babies hear things that are novel. So, um, when you hit around nine or 10 or 11, the brain finishes a lot of lateralization, a lot of division, and you end up with a left hemisphere for most people driven language system, which is producing language in the front left and receiving language or understanding language in the back left oversimplified. And occasionally, a very small fraction of people, it's reversed. And at that point, after that 9 to 11-year-old, when it finishes doing that division, um, you actually lose the ability to hear new phonemes, new, new speech sounds. So after that, it's very, very difficult to, for instance, learn a new language without an accent. Nearly impossible for most people. This is why accents are a thing. Mm-hmm. Because any phoneme you haven't heard uh, before, uh, uh, before age 9 or 10 you probably won't hear after age 9 or 10 or 11, evolutionarily speaking. If you hear a sound, it's probably a variant of a sound in your language. So you should be able to you know, rest that sound around into your understanding. You, you, you know, I have a very different accent than you do, uh, for instance, but we sound uh, – we're mutually intelligible, hopefully. hopefully. And, um, <laughs> you know, right? And, but but it's, it's, it's a function of sort of distorting the phonemes you're used to hearing yourself produce and mm-hmm. matching them to ones I'm producing without noticing them. And so if I had a slightly different sound that wasn't in your language, you would map it to a sound in your language. This is why accents and weird speech are a thing. So la- music has, doesn't seem to have the same critical period. So as you develop second languages as an adult, you don't develop the same regions. You develop some mm-hmm. other regions, actually, which you should do. You should develop a second hemisphere language, essentially. But music is a whole brain phenomenon anyways. So you work on that sort of symbol manipulation, timing, prosody, linguistic thing that I'm, we've been describing – but you work on it with a, a continually bilateral representation, motor integration. And there's some theory that language is a motor skill and that language came out of a motor uh, of a movement uh, communication thing. This is the, the, the movement theory of language, why we talk with our hands and things like that. But um, it may or may not be completely true uh, or not, not only true as uh, the only reason. But music is something that requires motor integration. And there's lots of evidence showing bilateral motor integration can repattern the brain. Things from uh, interactive metronome working autistic kids to really powerful things like um, Reinhard Flatschler's Takatina, which is a rhythm training program that makes you do one rhythm signature in your hands, one in your mouth, step in a third time signature, while someone's doing a fourth time signature with a piece of musical instrument. Wow. And it messes with your – it's great for someone like you who like is a, is a serious musician. It's also great for people that can't hear time because yeah. it, it completely messes with your – it basically embodies time in Takatina. Um, you build up with a facilitator embodying two or three time signatures at once or, or, or uh, points of time at once, which is just polyrhythm. And if you're a you know, West African musician, you can do it or something. But if you're not, it's bizarre. And if you think about it, you fall over and break and you can't keep doing it. But doing a little bit of Takatina, if you're high functioning or interactive metronome, if you're not, will do this interactive sort of bo- cross midline voluntary control of motor and time. That's a lot of what music is doing but tied into almost like a linguistic way of understanding once you're a musician, once you're actually using music and not, aren't technically executing, once music's not a foreign language or an instrument mm. isn't a foreign language. Like piano to me is a foreign language. I enjoy the sounds that it makes, uh, you know, and I can like sit there and go, hey, wait, this is a C, that's this note, that's this note. Ooh, that's a chord. Ooh, yeah. cool. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> or whatever. But I, I can't like play it. Yeah. Um, and even guitar, I'm like, okay, I know like six things. I mean, in spite of what you see around me, it's like six things. Yeah. But you give you give me like a couple West African drums, and I will just talk to you all day long, you know. And 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 I'll play all night, all day long, and I'll play back and forth, and wow. I'll, I'll do phrases, and I'll talk at, I'll talk with it. It's fine. And I can give you mnemonic, you know, phrases and play them back in my hands, and it's it's easy. It's, I, I can just think with with music. Um, you know, if you're playing a piano an hour a day, you probably can do that too. You probably can improvisationally think with your sound coming out of your hands. I would yeah. argue that's closer to language at some point once it's overlearned, once, once it's, mm-hmm. once it's a, a system, instead of um, something like performance. or It's not a sport. It's not mm-hmm. an exercise. It's not a, 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 a thing you're doing. It now becomes a communication metric and modality. And we feel it that way. We've, you know, music changes how we feel. And we, it's been that way. So I, I, I think you can develop, and we often we sort of owe it to ourselves to develop 
music as language within our brains, and that will create a healthier brain. It reduces aging, reduces uh, other uh, aspects of mental illness and instability in the brain long term. There's all kinds of research, and I can go into it, but it's, I mean, you sort of owe it to yourself to exercise, to meditate, become a musician. These are the low hanging fruits for improving your brain and sort of keeping trajectories. I'm all about trajectories and uh, I'm, a, I'm a gerontologist. So I teach gerontology to my students about modifying very small things in your life day to day, tiny things that are effortless or small that produce huge shifts into the trajectories. You don't decline over time. You flatten trajectories of, de of decline or even hack yourself into uh, you know, improvements. And you can do that with lots of things actually across the life course. You know, easy things uh, become like minimizing starch and sugar, maximizing mm -hmm. fat, obviously. But there's lots of things you can do, and music becomes one of those things. Meditation becomes one of those things. Um, if you uh, want to maintain or you've gotten yourself into difficult circumstances, you can do things like fasting to really dramatically shift. I had a, a lovely fasting. I, I do this course in the winter at UCLA some, some years called Psych of Aging, and I make my students do a modifiable behavior exercise. They do a week and a half, 10 days of watching something in their life. So they track their sleep and track their quality of life every day and watch some aspect of their behavior they think might not be ideal or they might want to change. Exercise, diet, some little aspect, they just watch it. Yeah. And then they, and they make a change and then watch it for 10 days. Just a simple little experiment, a modifiable experiment. It's really little. It's making just to try something and half the experiment, see how hard it is or easy it is. And half of them are like, oh, my God, this little thing I did makes a massive change in my life. And, mm. it, and, I dis and, and they come to become biohackers. They discover they have control. Yeah. But I, but I, I, I hadn't never really done real fasting. I did um, – starting at the end of January this, this year, I did a alternate day fasting for about four months. Okay. Um, really enjoyed it and uh, yeah. you know, lost 43 pounds or something. Wow. And, 12% body fat and That's you know awesome. um yeah i got, got lots of energy i'm waking up at 4 a.m without an alarm every day and you know hitting the world hard and you know it's great and really dialed in my energy in a way that it's a little bit too too energetic well you know that, that i know what you mean, high yeah. is, is is no is is no nonsense you can be careful with that stuff that's this naturally uh, occurring ketones are crazy uh in terms yeah. of uh energy and productivity but um it's about modifiable behavior taking control and i think music is one of those things for people i think you should and can and people Anyone can be musical. It doesn't matter what you do. If you move, if you can walk, you can dance. You know, if you can talk, you can sing. If, 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 if you, everyone has the ability to do music. And I've done um, rhythm instruction with people with profound cognitive impairments. I've done rhythm instruction with people who are some of the most gifted athletes in the world. And they all get rhythm pattern. They all get some benefit from it. Just like I've done neurofeedback or biofeedback on the brain with – People that are profoundly impaired with, you know, massive autism and self-stimming and no language, no eye contact. And I've done neurofeedback with some of the highest level athletes who are meddling in every podium they walk by. You know, I have yeah. a few. I mean, and, and it's the same process, i.e. exercise in the brain. It's just the difference between working with somebody who has some you know, real significant deficit needs versus some performance goals. But the, the overall process is the same, taking control of this stuff. And so, again, I think music is one of those things we owe it to ourselves to do more and more and more of who, regardless of what it is, uh, for us, you know, I love that. Yeah. And, and, uh, especially if you look back historically, ancestrally, like you say, everyone was engaging in music or dance. These things were all part of being human. It's not like there were singers and there were, you know, separate people who were non-singers and, or, or even musicians and non-musicians. But I am interested to, to dig in a little more and ask you, uh, what, what is that threshold? Is there one where you where you transition into the musician? Is it when you can improvise and speak with mm. your instrument? Maybe it's a great question. I would say, yeah, I, I would say that's the when you can when you can reach for a sound and have it happen without thinking about it, okay. not executing yeah. it. You know, what, when when it stops becoming a tool and starts becoming part of your body. I mean, the human brain does this. It's a very unique thing about higher level primates, mostly humans. When we use a tool, you know, uh, coffee cup even meditation bowl, um, whatever it is, uh, where if we use it enough, we map it onto the brain as if it's part of the body and we actually end up with like a little coffee cup area or a pencil area or a, you know, mouse area for using a tool or a steering wheel area on the brain. And we map it briefly onto the brain as an extension of our physical you know, body. We learn to use it that way. So I think if you are uncomfortable holding your guitar and you're like, it's note, 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 mm -hmm. you probably aren't yet a musician, but if you only know, one string and you're able to like go up and down and have fun with it, you probably are. You yeah. don't have to necessarily okay. have music. Or if the only thing you can do is play a clave, you know, a, a, a woodblock, 
And the only thing you're doing is playing a, um, a sun clave, you know, go, 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 one, two, do, do, do. And all you're doing is that, and it's in time, and it's in, you're enjoying it. There's nothing technically challenging. It's about sitting in time and feeling the music. Then you're a musician. If you're feeling the time and you're communicating with the music, then you're a musician. And music, music's about time, not about the sound. I mean, you can have mm -hmm. music with no melody, right? And rhythm is music. Mm -hmm. and, and rhythm, or you know, sound in time, is actually more about the space between the sounds. But leaving time, as, as opposed to executing on the, yeah. the, the interruption of, of, that, of that silence. So that's, I think, the, really the binding moment of music for people, is the, is the ability to pattern your attention in time that way and know when things are and aren't happening and turn off and on the execution. When you bring in a motor execution component, i.e. you're a musician, you're delivering that staccato interaction with time and information, often with another person. I mean, I, I think you're right. It's, it, historically, that was the, the – music was in profoundly transformative for individuals, but it was also an incredibly social thing. I mean, even yeah. 80 years ago, 70, 60 years ago in this country, we didn't have much television, so after dinner, you all open up the – the, uh, the Gibson cabinet or the mandolin cabinet, plus your mandocello, your mandolin, your yeah. mandola, your violin, and everyone sat around in the family and everyone knew an instrument or two and you know played your instruments instead of watching TV because that's what you did because you couldn't afford, you know, because of electricity and you, know, you couldn't afford lamp oil that night or something, so you sat around playing, playing instruments until you were tired. So it was a thing we all did and it was very, very social, but it's not communication. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, if you can speak, you can sing. I think if you can sing, you're basically a musician. So yeah. speaking, you know, if you route it through some some prosody that has tone, you can actually route it through a different set of timing resources, and you become a singer. This mm -hmm. is why you can sing. Uh, this is why people who stutter can sing even if they can't speak. That is fascinating to me. Because you route it through music. Yeah. And you produce a common tone if you can sing a little bit in your speech. You will never stutter, ever. So if you're ever stammering, put a little tone in your voice, you'll stop stammering. And you can move around the stutter or the stammer. Um, it's a really reliable trick because you switch circuits. You move from that mm -hmm. Broca's Wernicke's timing circuit on the left that's doing a weird – it's almost like if you stutter dramatically, usually – it's kind of like um, having an audio delay in a monitor where you okay, just can't yeah. speak because it because there's a feedback delay or you're on a, on a bad Skype call with somebody and it's right. like echoing. It's rough. You just can't speak. You can't do it. Because you're used to doing the monitor of your own speech with an area in the back of the brain. You do a monitor of your own speech. If that area can't time what you're saying reliably, mm -hmm. then you can't speak. So we can get things like uh, fluent aphasia, speaking nonsense, or things like just some basic stuttering at the ends of those uh, extreme uh, spectrums for timing of speech. But music – ends up working through a different set of resources and it brings in the whole brain and doesn't rely so much on that Broca's Wernicke's timing system to input output speech for you. So yeah, you can you get whole brain phenomena and it's another form of uh, biohacking and exercise. Yeah. And I also consider it dexterity practice. You know, there are kind of like different aspects of my life that I want to keep up. And it's not just like the big muscle groups. I don't want to just be strong. I also want to be precise, you know, and I feel like there's something, well, even if you just go back a little bit, shooting a bow and arrow i've tried a few times it is hard it's really really hard and to think back it's like a lot of us just used to be able to do that from from being kids probably right and so like maintaining dexterity i think is another kind of like side benefit of music it's not the only thing but it's it's one of the side benefits of arts in general that that really can i think improve the quality of life and, and especially when you look at some of these musicians or artists who are you know in their 80s 90s who should have been dead at 50 it's amazing to see what they can still do yeah that's right exactly like you know keith richards uh, uh <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, basically every time you buy a guitar somebody sacrifices a string to keith richards right um the uh, the um <laughs> yeah, I, there's a, a drummer who i um sort of I, I learned a lot from some of people uh who learned from him named baba tunde alatunde who died a few years ago um, and Babo, at the end of his life, he was really quite ill, kidney disease, I think. Um, and he would come out on stage helped by these two big giant guys who can be helped out onto stage. And they would strap his djembe onto him. And he's like, you know, probably early 80s at that point. And he would be very frail and kind of like come out. And then he would sort of just start playing. And, you know, within five minutes, it was like the, the years just rolled off of him. Yeah. And by the end of his hour long set, he was this vibrant, young, like 40 year old strident, like walking up and down and doing wow. his little thing. And because the music, he had so many years of moving himself in that motor pattern, 
and embodying music that he still had the ability, even a fairly, you know, injured and crippled and sort of uh, ill body to evoke that same kind of physiological vigor through music, but by yeah. just engaging with it as a pattern, a motor pattern, essentially as a, as an activity. So it's inspiring. Uh, it really is. Yeah. And you don't have to be that level to get the benefit. Seriously. You can just sit there right. and, you know, tap on your, I, I, I do a lot of drum instruction in, um, in, in West Africa, Malinke drumming, Mende drumming, the, um, weak hand on a bass drum is playing a bell. So I'm, uh, so you're playing ding, 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 you're playing a, a stick on the skin with your strong hands. The weak hand's hard to keep moving. If you aren't used to being, to using both hands, the weak hand's hard to keep playing with. So I have people grab an unsharpened pencil and play on their dashboard, a simple double or shuffle or triple or something to whatever song they're listening to and try to keep consistency. It's a really great way of trying to, to entrain with time is use the wrong side of your, you know, body to play a simple entrainment and you'll find you can't do it. And if you haven't practiced it. Or yeah. you can do it, but you have no stamina, which is what usually happens. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really easy way. There's a, there's a bunch of physiological tricks for really taking quick control of the systems and timing control. We'll repattern yourself and retrain yourself very rapidly. So we're doing things with controlling your breathing or controlling your gaze direction. Um, these are sort of biofeedback, if you will, uh, uh, control systems that are built in. You know what mm. your eyes are doing, what your mm -hmm. what your breathing is doing. Um, will control the vagal tone and a bunch of stress response and how you slice up time and a bunch of other things. So you have some control over moment to moment states and then you can train traits by doing things like language training, workouts, exercise, neurofeedback, mm -hmm. meditation, and they train resources over time. I mean, you shouldn't use meditation as a stress intervener. You should use it to train a tendency away from stress over time, spaciousness, not to, to meditate or be mindful to intervene in the uh, in the moment of panic or stress. Yeah. It's not really useful for that. But there are things you can do in the moment that will that are involuntary tricks. Dr. Huberman uh, at Stanford talks about um, changing the, the, the gaze direction, going from converge vision where you slice up time very quickly and you're stressed to diverge vision, looking at horizon, involuntarily down-regulates how quickly you slice up time and wow. completely breaks a, a panic, stress, rapid shifting. Uh, I'm using this, this, this trick a lot of my clients who have some stress response and they're, they're loving this ability to pull back, look at a horizon, and just involuntarily drop. And you've experienced this if you looked at an ocean or up at the sky at night. You've experienced, I mean, a sense of bigness, but also a sense of like, almost like stillness. That's time shifting inside of you, part of that. Um, and that is involuntary. It happens if you move your eyes from tight to, to open, essentially. So looking at a big horizon. And there's other things like extending the out breath versus the in breath will down regulate. But those have to be, um, some of those skills have to be voluntarily controlled. Mm -hmm. And I really like to sit and, uh, help you get rid of the resources. So most of what I do with people is, is neurofeedback or, or exercise in the brain through uh, doing biofeedback on the brain waves and the blood, and the blood flow to, to change the resources essentially. So what does that look like for people who, who aren't aware of it? Of it? Yeah. So broadly, neurofeedback, um, most of the field is focused on EEG training or brain wave training and brain waves are, you know, electricity your brain makes in different frequencies all the time. And you can exercise or tune up different frequencies to get different resources. So um, people can come at this again from a symptom res resolution perspective or a peak performance perspective. But the idea is that there's, uh, you want to find a human goal or performance thing that's in the way and then exercise it. So that's the very high level to operationalize it. We start the process with what's called a brain map or a quantitative EEG, a QEEG. We put a cap on your head, squirt it full of gel. Um, have you sit still for a few minutes and record resting baselines, very high level trait resources, and then compare your brain to a database of other people your age and see how unusual you are and look for the big statistical patterns there and do some executive function testing, look for big patterns there against the population and try to find all the impulsivity and attention, stress response, switching system, speed of processing, lack of sleep onset or deep sleep, injury markers, you know, 30 things or so I look for across a bunch of different physiological markers. But this is not medicine where I'm saying, I'm a doctor. Here's what's wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, here's, here's what's unusual. It's more like science or coaching where we're saying, hey, here's some data. What are your goals? Oh, I think I see a, um, a thing in the data that will move your goal towards where you want. Let's operationalize some stuff and get there. And I'm really emphasizing this coach-athlete or coach-performer relationship more than a doctor-patient because yeah. – a doctor will set your goals for you and value them for you. Oh, this is true for you. This is what's wrong. But uh, me, I mean, most neurofeedback people are doctors or therapists at least, mm -hmm. and they have this sort of top-down perspective where they're doing stuff for you and to you. Um, I really don't like that. I think this should be 
um, personal training. And so I, uh, Peak Brain, my, my company, approaches this like fitness. So we assess your brain with a QEEG and an attention test and say, okay, great. So it looks like your um, vigilance is lower than average by two standard deviations and you're showing lots of delta waves. You aren't getting good deep sleep. Huh. So you're really burnt out. Oh, and your alpha waves are slower than they should be. So your speed of processing is slower. Uh, you must have some afternoon word finding issues. Oh, you do? Ah, okay. Well, it's because of this deep sleep issue then. And that's why your vigilance sucks. So would you, does this matter to you? Is this, well, A, is this valid? Oh, it is? It sounds true? Okay, good. And B, does it matter? Do you want to work on it? Is it getting in the way? Oh, it does. Okay. So then once you have a sense of the big performance bottlenecks you want to work on, you do neurofeedback or biofeedback to get rid of those problems. And so here's one example. Um, in ADHD and in all other forms of impulsivity, essentially, you end up with a high ratio of theta brain waves to beta brain waves. Your theta is high, receptive attention, noticing patterns, squirrel, you know, mm -hmm. but your beta, your linear gas pedal is a little bit lower relative to the receptive reactive kind of mode, um, theta beta ratio. And so you can measure the amount of theta relative to beta moment to moment the brain's making. So you can stick a wire on the top of the head, a single wire, a couple of ear clips, just measure what's coming off that sort of attention management area. And whenever the theta happens to dip a little bit, you go, good job, brain, with audio and visual feedback. Hmm. And when the, when the theta goes in the wrong direction, you stop the feedback. And the brain's like, hey, I was watching that. Where's that information? And then the brain happens to change on its own. And we go, hey, good job, brain. So it's good job, nope. Good job, good job, good job, nope. With like a spaceship flying faster or a Pac-Man eating more dots or a car hitting more zombies or something. Or music swelling in volume when you're, when you're studying and then dropping away when you're distracted or something. Okay. So you can exercise certain resources – and it's actually mostly involuntary. This is um, operant conditioning, like Skinner's pigeons, not Pavlov's dogs. We, we shape a behavior, shape up and down very gently certain amounts of brain waves, connectivity patterns. And the idea is we're, we, we think we know what we're doing. We think we're exercising your brain towards certain resources. And then tomorrow or the next day we see what happens. And this is a subtle shift. If it's the right shift, we do more of the same. So it's kind of like you know, iterative personal training. We do three to, five, three to six months, really. Um, I get permanent changes usually about three months in. Wow. And I usually get about two standard deviations of change on executive function performance test about two, about two, uh, what's that, about three months in. Wow. So we, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of crazy to say, but in brain changes, actual measured physiology does not change otherwise. Yeah. And in performance, executive function testing routinely, we get two standard deviations of change in three, maybe four months. So 40 to 50 half an hour sessions of neurofeedback. Wow. So it's almost like permanent exercise in some ways. It rebuilds the machine. Mm -hmm. The trick here is... It's kind of like you're a personal trainer working with clients where when a client walks in, you aren't really sure, even after a fitness assessment, if they have one elbow per arm or 17. And so there's a little bit of like, I wonder what will work for this person. I think I know. Let yeah. me try it. Ooh, it didn't quite work. Let me adjust. Uh, oh, there we go. And you have to very iterate and hunt and pack. And so I do a lot of brain mapping. Every 20 sessions, I map the brain again and do a lot of very iterative work on very core resources and building up more aggressive resources over time. Have you report back your sleep, your stress, your mood changes to me day to day? Um, about five sessions in, you start feeling things. You're like, wait a minute, I'm feeling a little different. It's hmm. kind of like when you haven't worked out before, about two weeks into going to the gym, one day you got out of bed and you're like, ooh, my balance feels a little different. Right. This is kind yeah. of interesting. It's subtle. And you're like, ooh, I slept really well. That was kind of wow. Things will shift globally. Mm -hmm. And in neurofeedback, the first things to shift are sleep onset and sleep depth. Uh, and impulsivity and afternoon fatigue all kind of shift as well in the first like three or four weeks. Okay. So two weeks in, you're like, wait a minute, I'm feeling a tiny bit different. And then your sleep starts to change and you report back and you sort of steer the process by saying, oh, this happened. I like it. Oh, my sleep was thrown off this way or my, I was a little more stressed or less stressed. And you, and you report which resources are fluctuating and you exercise those resources to get better change. And then we go back to the data every 20 sessions, map your brain, do attention testing, and I get about two thirds of a standard deviation for most people every 20 sessions of change. Wow. So, you know, 50 sessions, four months of training, eliminates ADHD for everybody, just about. Drops anxiety back to manageable levels. Knocks seizures back in the literature by more than 50% on average. Wow. And 5% five, 5 of people get complete control. Everyone I've worked with a seizure has really dramatic changes and has um, either almost none or complete control. So I get better than 50% change in seizure. Um, PTSD, I do a lot of free work with veterans coming back with blast injuries. Plus, you know, people with developmental PTSD and things. And PTSD, I often kick at the veterans to finish their free programs because halfway through they're feeling incredible and they're getting on with their lives. 
and they're mm. often like you know it's it's often like a little hard for them to get in my office but it's the place that they're getting the free service yeah so and once they're feeling better now they're getting a full-time job and they're across town wow. and, you know they're they're great so but if your brain the, the point here is not what these individual things are adhd ptsd anxiety seizures migraines it's well what's your brain doing you don't like or if you have a problem, that's that's the perspective. Or what do you want it to do if it's fine? You can go after brain activity and go, ooh, here's a speed of processing thing. I want to be smarter. You can train up how fast you think and and perform better on intelligence tests. I'm, I'm hedging. I'm not saying it's going to make give you higher IQ because I don't believe in, in intelligence really as a, as a valid concept in the brain. But I do believe in things like speed of processing and working memory and depth of sleep and recovering from stress and resilience throughout high levels of performance and stress and changing dynamic uh, uh, constraints. So those things are completely achievable for everyone, no matter what brain you have. I mean, this process works regardless of who you are, and it works basically if you have a brain. It was discovered uh, more than 50 years ago, 52 uh, years ago now, 1967. Wow, I didn't this realize form, that. Uh, by Dr. Barry Sturman at UCLA on cats because it raised the seizure threshold of cats and made them resistant to having seizures from rocket fuel exposures dramatically. Wow. Um, and he discovered this by mistake, actually, a little bit. He did a learning experiment, and, and, and months later, these cats were seizure resistant. So, you know, the joke I tell now is that cats are really bad instruction followers. This is not a placebo process. You know, it, it's sort of involuntary exercise of your brain waves. You, as the voluntary, skilled, high performant person, doesn't necessarily do something in the chair each time. You decide what to work on. And then you decide if it worked the next couple of days and steer what, what we're trying, the iteration process. But I do a lot of work or have historically, not so much anymore because I work more with really high-level people. Um, about half of my clients are super high performers now. But I used to do a lot of work with very impaired people, a lot of nonverbal people, a lot of people in, in coma, autism, severely impaired cognitively. And you know, many of these people are just not terribly checked in to the outside world. And it works to push brains around regardless. If you can perceive information, you can get training. I've worked with people that are blind and deaf. And instead of using audio and visual, you put them on a rumble pad, a, a tactile rumble strip, and, and or, or give them a teddy bear that they hold. And it, and it vibrates gently whenever their brain shifts more towards wow. a seizure-resistant state. Yeah. You train the seizures away in an autistic kid who's nonverbal and deaf and blind, for instance, and having lots of seizures. Really impaired brains often have seizures. Once you get really severely developmentally disabled, the incidence of other things goes way, way, way up, including seizures and, you know, uh, sleep issues and other stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, you can basically take control of your brain activity is the take home message. Uh, so you should, and uh, just like you should become a musician, you should probably also meditate and manage the diet, whatever that is for you. And it's different. I mean, I mean you and I would probably converge on a high fat, low carb, some periods of fasting, you know, really healthy whole foods kind of diet. Yeah. Other people have ethical, spiritual, or other personal reasons for choosing plant-based diets that I don't think are, you know, neuroscientifically all that valid. But there can be some good reasons for to do those diets. I think for individuals, mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're, the thing about, about humans and diet, humans are infinitely adaptable into the short term, yeah. and often pretty adaptable in the long term. And and you can look at cultures that have high starch diets, even like uh, Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. um, where they have all APOE four. Most Papua New Guineans have APOE 4-4 status, meaning they oxidize starches really rapidly and, and theoretically would produce a high Alzheimer's, high atherosclerosis kind of population state because they basically mm -hmm. are primed to have a, you know, to have the worst response to starch, like a standard Western diet would kill them, right? But Papua New Guineans have no atherosclerosis and no Alzheimer's hmm. in spite of high APOE 4 Yeah, because they live in a microbially dirty environment. An amyloid beta is an innate immune molecule. So instead of causing Alzheimer's, it's cleaning up all the toxins in the jungle, essentially. Wow. So and and the same thing. They're you know they can handle high starch because they aren't just flooding amyloid with starch, essentially, or or, or glucose. You know, glucose so, so it oxidizes rapidly. Um, the, 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 the glycation of amyloid and glycation of Lewy bodies and glycation of tissues in the brain is actually a major aspect of the diseases of aging, especially Alzheimer's and uh, aspects of Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. So really huge to accelerate, to get kerosene on the fire of aging is, is starch. Um, Papua New Guineans who have all the characteristics a, an American would die from rapidly with diabetes and Alzheimer's and, and, and cancer and high blood pressure um, – they seem to thrive perfectly well because they're adapted to the environment. The high APOE4 balances all the risk factors, essentially. Um, 
you know, you too can take control. You don't have to go live in the jungle. If you have APOE4, you can do things like minimize your starch, do sauna three times a week, do neurofeedback, meditate, exercise. Um, again, the take home message here is, you know, shift happens to get, get yours. Yeah. So, <laughs> and just to be clear, neural feedback is high tech, but it's not invasive. It's not like you're shocking your brain. Not at all. We don't zap the brain. That. So we measure what your brain is doing moment to moment. And when, when the brain changes in a possibly desired direction, we applaud or reward it with only audio and visual usually. So the idea is that, I mean, there are, there are forms of neurofeedback that do zap the brain. So mm -hmm. neurofeedback as a category, I can't say there's no zapping. There's a small fraction of the population that does zap. Techniques like lens, direct neurofeedback, HPN, are all micro-stimulation technologies that, that will systematically do um, very tiny little zaps to break up uh, scar tissue, essentially, in, in cases of injury and HPN and, and um, uh, CTE and, and NFL players are very successful. But you can do traditional neurofeedback, which is gently exercise in the brain itself mm -hmm. and get just as good results. So I don't do any zapping technology at peak brain. But yes, we're, we're operantly conditioning. We're, ex we're, we're teaching the brain how to change itself. By, by applauding certain things it's already doing. It's already changing a little bit here and there. We're saying, yeah, yeah, more of that. Ooh, look, brain, good job, more of that. And since the brain likes input, after your training session, for the next 24 hours, it'll do a little bit more. I mean, within 10 minutes, my, my dissertation work shows, within 10 minutes, the brain's yoking to the frequency we're asking it to make more or less of. It's like, ooh, hey, interesting. Hmm. And so the brain's picking it up. You don't feel it right away. You feel it maybe five, six sessions in, three, well, three to five. Um, but after a few sessions, you then feel it the next day, generally. Very subtle effect. So the brain's like, ooh, I got more input for dropping my theta today. That was interesting. So tomorrow, your theta's a little bit lower while the brain tries to figure out why it was getting more input for dropping theta. And so you tomorrow will go, oh, I felt less distractible. That was kind of interesting. Or I didn't feel anything. And we go, okay, we'll adjust the protocol. But usually you go, oh, I felt a little bit of this. Great. Do it again. The next day, the brain gets more of a reward the next day you train for its drops in theta. And the brain's like, oh, hey, look it, I'm getting information again for my drop in theta, that's super exciting. I wanna do a lot of that. So it does a lot of it in the session the next time, you feel even more. Okay. And then tomorrow, you feel a little bit different. You say, oh, I, I noticed something. So your job is to sort of steer that course as things unfold and executive function, stress, sleep, mood, attention, those things will fluctuate day to day. And you'll report what's happening. Kind of like we work you out and say, we build a workout machine with you, work you out, and then tomorrow go, hey, did your bicep feel it? Did, did you get the bicep workout? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many elbows you're working with here. And you're like, yeah, I felt my bicep. It was kind of nice. Or no, actually, it was really sore. We did something. It was too much. Yeah. Or it didn't, didn't, didn't feel a thing. You wouldn't experience that doing curls, of course, but you can experience that in neurofeedback. Didn't feel much because we didn't land on anything you need right away or overtrained you where you feel super fatigued later or kind of lit up and you can't fall asleep and you like clean your entire house. Like things can happen, you know, so you have to be cautious not to push super hard in neurofeedback. But it's fitness. It's like, let's try something, yeah. iterate, try something, iterate, and then go back to the data the way that we do it every so often to make sure that we're actually, you know, know what's happening. Yeah. So I love it. We're coming up on time, but before we go, I want to make sure we, uh, we talk at least for, for a second. What can people do, uh, like you said, to kind of prevent big problems down the road? Since you study aging, a lot of people are interested in what they can do now. Yeah, there's a couple of big things everyone should do. Uh, minimizing starch is a huge one. And yeah. You have to, I mean, I mean, we have so much processed fat that it's hard to avoid that if you're eating uh, anywhere. But, but starch is the killer when combined with anything else, free starch and high amounts of starch. So people always then want me to quantify that. And it's hard to do because people are so variable. And if you're the average person with relatively adequate insulin sensitivity <clears throat> and you're somewhat active, you can probably handle up to about 100 grams of carbs a day. And you can probably handle something like 20 to 30 grams in any one sitting. Mm -hmm. And something more than about 25 or 30 will probably spike your blood sugar a little bit. And if you want to avoid insulin insensitivity, avoid spiking your blood sugar. Keep starch consumption to below roughly 20 grams in any one sitting, roughly below 100 a day. If you're an athlete, you can go up a little bit on that. And then you can eat your carbs right after you work out mm -hmm. aggressively hard to avoid bonking and to cause refeeding of glycogen. Um, that's the first thing you can do. It's not that hard to do. 65 to 100 grams a day. If you're a woman, you can go up more than 100. Men who are athletes, more like 65, so you just want to stay lean. But that's actually kind of hard to maintain. It's a lifestyle thing. It's more of a paleo, keto thing. It's fine. It works great. Um, you honestly can do lots with diet. You don't have to just do that version. The system's so dynamic that it actually responds really well to aggressive pushes. This is why any diet works. Any elimination diet works, period, for a while, anyone. doesn't matter what it is. 
eating nothing but cauliflower. Works amazingly well for like five weeks. Eat nothing but cabbage, nothing but meat. Works incredibly well. Some of those diets are sustainable. Some are not. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can do some crazy things like you can eat whatever you want completely, 100%, 4,000 calories a day every other day if you want. That is right. a sustainable way to eat for many people. You will maintain insulin, sati- and insulin insensitivity. You'll maintain good uh, cholesterol profiles, lipid profiles, and you'll actually lose weight eating high starch and high fat alternate days and nothing. I mean, that, that's a, it's actually not a, a great way to eat for if you have risks of cardiovascular health and oxidation and some other issues, you can cause problems. But, you know, that kind of hormetic stress pushing the system through flexibility points is not the worst thing in the world. And I would agree that in some ways doing a really aggressive metabolic flexibility protocol like alternate day fasting is a little bit more evolutionarily sound than is keto or carnivore per se. Let's say carnivore, which is, you know, of course, it's just, just meat. Because I, I don't think it, 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 you know, a variability, dynamism here is, is life and static is death. And so I think, you know, you, don't, it, you, you can have great abs and have great lipid profiles from eating car, uh, keto or paleo or, 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 or carnivore for a long time. But if you haven't fixed your insulin sensitivity that well and you walk by a donut shop and fall into a coma because you smelled some starch, something's wrong. Yeah. You know, or if you can't like go to your friend's house and like have half of an apple cider or something that they made for you or a nice pit of, you know, maybe don't eat gluten, but someone made a pie. Well, have a bite. I mean, it's the sort of I, I sort of view, view gluten the way that traditional old school Tibetans view meat. Like if someone else makes it, OK, thank you. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I'm really happy to have it. And, and, and you know, this this wheat stock died for my for my lovely uh, bit of you know pastry. Great. But if I do that every day, I, 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 I get in trouble. You know, um, some of that's metabolic flexibility. Some of it's some, some wheat intolerance, not gluten. I actually do fine with gluten, but, but not wheat, oddly enough, hmm. according to my functional medicine guy. My, my genes don't like wheat, but yep. they're okay with gluten. Interesting. So, but I, I find I can handle gluten uh, in large amounts every so often, no problem, but chronically major problems. So I have to be yeah. cautious. But, but you know, you don't have to do alternate day fasting. You don't have to do keto or paleo or primal or carnivore to get all the benefits. Most of the benefits can be had with simple, quote unquote, intermittent fasting, i.e. restricted time feeding. Eat within, for men, an eight to nine or 10 hour window, for women, a 10 to 12 hour window every day. Um, You can just do that as the first intervention, the lowest hanging fruit here. Yeah. Uh, um, Although only eat fruit if they're full of water, like berries. Um, (laughs) The um, the lowest hanging fruit is to have a time restricted window like eight to 10 hours for men. The thing people often do wrong in modern intermittent fasting culture is they end their window bef- just before bed. You need yeah. to, your eating window. You need to end your eating window at least three to four hours before bed. Otherwise, you're going to go to sleep with high insulin, suppress the only big giant pulse of growth hormone you get nine minute, 90 minutes later. And if you're 40 or above, you're not getting any other growth hormone basically in your life mm-hmm. except for that small pulse you get um, 90 minutes after you fall asleep. So you really want to have low insulin at that point. It's really critical. So my rule of thumb for my, my coaching clients is now go to bed a little hungry, wake up tired, wake up energetic and full, go to bed full, wake up tired and hungry. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the only constraint there is if you have a history of privation, if you've grown up without food, mm-hmm. if you've grown up um, with, with food being used emotionally or as a punishment or uh, with some neglect or abuse, food may be triggering or yeah. going to bed hungry may be triggering. Mm-hmm. So you may have to manage that a little bit and, and not trigger yourself just to you know, have nice abs or to improve lipid profiles. Um, the other piece of it is that, um, you know, food's very personal. So we have to, again, all these rules about food, I've, I've learned to be very cautious about saying anything strong about food here because, sure. uh, um, it's very personal, but, um, you should control your food. The other evolutionary thing to balance about late night eating is that that's when our appetite's highest because we wouldn't necessarily eat three meals a day with lots of macronutrients in all forms every day. Mm-hmm. We would eat every so often in large amounts, perhaps evolutionarily. So before the first fast we're going to do every day, i.e. sleep, uh, appetite ramps up. So if there's food available, we get it when it's most useful, when we'll deposit it as lipid, when we will um, you know, not have to be active, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So nowadays our appetite ramps up, of course, you know, still before bedtime mm-hmm. and we give into it and snack, which is sort of a perfect storm against the standard Western diet and insulin insensitivity and a bunch of stuff like that. So it's very, very difficult to lean into high reward value food late at night 
as a stress response. Yeah. It's sort of a perfect storm. You know, either food's difficult for you or sugar and high, you know, fat and salt fruit that's appetitive, has high reward value and is soothing for you. And your appetite's highest at the end of the night. Perfect storm of that's why that's why late night snacking is a thing. It's mm -hmm. why, you know, it's why, why there aren't books on how to avoid early morning snacking. There's no books on that. <laughs> that's true. You know, there's, the, there's, there's no books on um, why can't you drink wh – why can you only drink five beers? Why can't you drink six? There's no books on how to get to the sixth beer, the seventh beer. You know, it's because we're trying to learn how to push against the system, and we have to learn the control handles on that system. And ghrelin and insulin and cortisol are doing things. So knowing you get 75% of your growth hormone 90 minutes into the night – means you shouldn't eat before bed, ideally, yeah. if you're not calorically deprived. And now you know the control system, you can get control over it, you can actually wake up with energy. So we shouldn't rely on the reward value of things to tell you. I really hate this term intuitive eating, really hate it. I think intuitive eating is great once you're incredibly educated about how your body responds to things. Sure. And you've done, and you've done lots of insulin sensitivity stuff, you felt stuff, you fasted. You're, then you can, t you can watch your body. But if you're used to responding to the um, the ghrelin and insulin themselves and the feeding and the high reward value and eat like most people do on the reward value on the time of, of the clock, um, then you're not going to eat intuitively. You're going to mm -hmm. eat towards reward value. That's, yeah. what, that's what people mean. Most people, when they say intuitive eating, it means eating in a structured way was too hard and I'm going to eat how I want. And most of them you know, there's very few successful intuitive eaters. Those who are successful have gone through lots of other things mm -hmm. and know what it means to have insulin surge. They feel it. They feel, and, and, and they know, and then, and they're doing sort of, they've done a lot of self-experimentation. It's not a category of eat what feels good or eat what you desire. That's the miss here. You know, that's, that's the millennial uh, mistake about intuitive eating. It's not about that. It's about yeah. learn the actual fairly rigorous uh, experimentation process of figuring out what your insulin does either subjectively or with a glucose monitor, mm -hmm. and then eat ways that don't cause inflammation and don't cause insulin insensitivity for you. Most of those ways are, this, are similar for most people. So, you, don't, you know, you can, you still have to adhere to the most rules. You know, like there's, there's no magic formula mm -hmm. for you, honestly. Mm -hmm. You may have some specific allergies or sensitivities or, you know, nutritional needs, but most things work for most people. And intuitive stuff I find, unless you're talking about a rigorous self-experimentation approach, mm -hmm. I find is really more of an apologist for, oh, eat what, eat what you want and don't worry about being and, – and, and, and I find it's sort of um, – intuitive eating is the, is the opposite of orthorexia. Okay. Right? Yeah. Orthorexia is the being rigid and adhering to rules so much that you're like, oh my god, I, I, I sniffed a carbohydrate after my workout, <laughs> right. and it was after the half hour window. Ah, you know, I'm not gonna get any gains for the next six months now, right. or something. You know, it's 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 kind of silly, and it's it's a form of um, it's a it's an eating disorder essentially, being too adhering to uh, eating and exercise and body stuff too too much is a problem. Yeah. The opposite of that, the orthogonal thing is uh, to orthorexia is intuitive eating, I find it as, as framed by many people, you know, I, and then again, I think it's, there's some truth to intuitive eating, but not if you use it as a, uh, panacea for why you shouldn't follow any rules. Right. I hear that. Well, we're, uh, we're just about out of time, but before we go, let's make sure we, uh, we can find you. Where's the best place to find Dr. Hill's work? So peakbraininstitute.com is our website, and we have lots of social media at Peak Brain LA, and I'm also, uh, I think, Andrew Hill PhD and all the social media as well. Um, and so please check us out on all the socials and uh, let us know your brain questions. We have chat boxes on the site with our senior staff standing by to answer cool brain coaching questions if you have them. And we have physical locations to do brain neurofeedback and brain mapping in uh, St. Louis, Los Angeles, Orange County, um, a brain mapping station in Malmö, Sweden, uh, wow. a few others, uh, throughout the world. So if you want to do some, some work with us, you don't have to do it all in the office. We can work with you for a couple of days in one of the offices and then deploy uh, neurofeedback gear and get you training yourself at home or in your office. Cool. So, uh, if you happen to come to one of our locations here in St. Louis or LA or Orange County or Sweden, uh, love to get your brain map at some point, And then we can you know talk about all your, uh, performance metrics at that point uh, on the show. If you're, if you're brave, that so. sounds like a blast. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm brave. Yeah, Let's feel, share feel all always, of my broken happy things. To come by. That's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how many head injuries and, and what kind of like sleep habits you have that aren't working for you. I have a few Mulligan, uh, head injuries. I think I was, I was into mountain biking for a while, you know, <laughs> uh, we'll probably see some, probably see some evidence of that here. And yeah, there. Yeah. I, I think we will. Well, anyway, that's something to look forward to. 
Cool. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care. This episode is brought to you by Wild Superfoods. Big news. After three plus years of nonstop tasting and testing, our brand new real food health supplements from Wild Superfoods are finally ready for you. Now, what does wild mean anyway? Well, we work with the laws of nature, not against them. We avoid anything artificial, genetically modified, or overly processed. Whether you need real food nutrition from fruits, veggies, and stress-fighting adaptogens in future greens, vitamins from vitamin D stack, balanced omegas in mega omegas, or immune-boosting probiotics in probiotic spheres, we have got you covered. Our shelf-stable nutraceuticals are of uncompromising quality, and they're convenient options for traveling, camping, emergency and disaster preparedness, as well as daily supplementation for optimal health. At Wild Superfoods, each of our products is lab-tested for purity and potency and formulated according to the latest cutting-edge developments in research, science, and medicine. Guaranteed nutrition no matter where you are. That's our promise to you, and we look forward to hearing how you like Wild Superfoods. And as a listener of Fat Burning Man, you can save over 80 bucks on a one-time purchase or save over $128 when you select subscribe and save. On top of that, you'll get free access to our coaching and meal planning community, the Fat Burning Tribe, which is normally $27 a month. All you have to do is head on over to Wild Superfoods. Dot com. All you have to do, type it in right now into that menu bar on your phone, tablet, computer, or anything else, VR goggles you might be using right now. Just check out wildsuperfoods.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you there. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for the Fat Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or a family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far, We've won four awards, hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and, and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors, and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a, a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now, along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again. And have a great week.